Can think. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I saw a video of you on, uh, I think it was, uh, was, it was either Stossel or Reason that posted it where you were doing a talk at, I believe it was a Canadian university and uh-huh. there were protesters. Only a hundred. Uh, protesters outside <laughs> oh, yeah. of it. Oh, yeah. Is that a, is that now is that a low amount of protesters? I know. You're saying, <laughs> that's a lot. For, yeah, yeah. That, that was yeah. that was the most. I mean, I've never had more than four protesters in any other event, um, and uh, uh, this was a, not a hundred protesters only. They created a body block to prevent people from coming. Yeah. Into, into wow. Pull, pull, pull it in. We're, we're going right now. You can pull that closer because this is fascinating. Up. So. They literally were preventing. This is what I saw in the video, at least, and I guess it's been confirmed. They were literally preventing people from just hearing him talk. And you know what they were chanting? Hmm. Fuck. Uh, they were saying "fuck Warren, fuck Warren" over and over again. It was like I was like, "What are they doing? Yeah. Why are they so angry?" They, they were angry because um, they felt that I, when I talk in the, about the politics of sex in a book I wrote called "The, the Myth of Male Power." that I talk about that, that there's a whole sexual dance that men and women have. And the, the traditional female dance has been um, attract, uh, resist, and the tr- traditional male dance has been pursue, persist. And that that tango is beginning to change. And it's probably very healthy that that tango is beginning to change, but that it isn't a one sex is bad and the other sex is good. Mm. And so we see this now with Kavanaugh, where, uh, you know, where the current culture of hashtag me too is being evaluated. So a boy today, ready to go into college, in 26 states in the United States, he needs to uh, get affirmative consent, which means the woman needs to say an affirmative yes before he he holds her hand. Uh, he, so he needs to ask her if he can hold her hand, and then she needs to say yes. And so if he doesn't say yes, he can legitimately be accused of sexual assault uh, for touching her hand without getting an affirmative consent. Now, she and this can, is in 26 states? This, this, is in tw- this is the law, some variation of that law, very close to what I'm saying, in 26 states in the United States. This is a result of the Office of Civil Rights under the Obama administration saying that there was f- the first layer of this was that um, uh, rape on campus was a common thing, which was not true, but it was based on the rape being defined of have you ever had sex in a way uh, at a time that you didn't feel like you wanted to have sex. No one explained that men, males on campus answer that question almost to the same degree as females do. But oh, for wow. but uh, for both males and females, the great majority of times, mm. it is like, you know, I got drunk and I got involved and I got started. It was a little bit like asking the question, um, have you eaten potato chips more frequently, more, more, mm. more potato chips than you've wanted when you started the process? Mm. And so both males and females feel uncomfortable, have had an experience at some point of doing that, but they use the, the female statistic only uh, to, to, to say that there is, um, you know, there's a rape ec- epidemic on campus. So from that, the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education issued it, what they call a Dear Colleague letter. And this letter said, um, if camp- campuses must do the following, they must have this affirmative consent. Um, and, and, then, and then if the male is accused at any... So uh, I'll, let me go back to the original part of that. Um, the male who does not get that affir- affirmative consent, who does get that affirmative consent, if the woman's, uh, he must also get it at every other stage of intimacy in the relationship, up until intercourse. So, like, can I hold your hand? Yes. Can I kiss you? Yes. Can Ex- I mm. hold can I, you? Yes. Can I can touch I, your can breast? I, can, whatever. Exactly. Can mm. I? Can I kiss you? Like a checklist. Can I, can I go from uh, kissing your lips to kissing t- tongue kissing and so on? And so, th- and and if he doesn't get that, he can be accused of sexual assault at, wow. any, at any given stage. But here's <laughs> the amazing thing: is that if he does, um, if he does do all that and gets an affirmative consent, and then later he's the one to initiate, <coughs> excuse me, a breakup in the relationship. Um, she might be angry at, at that and then say, Well, you really didn't get an affirmative consent at this stage or that stage. And so he has no paperwork to indicate that he does. So theoretically, if he really wants to protect himself, he has to get have paperwork to submit to her e- at each stage of intimacy. Wow. So you can, you, you you know, and of course. I mean, that's it, sexy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, right. really could sexy. you imagine getting yeah. it signed yeah. off? <laughs> exactly. I mean, and, and but you know, I want a blowjob. Hey, let's listen. Let's well, no, this that's, off. that's a very good point, Justin, because I. I don't even think women want that. Could you imagine being with a girl, feeling the chemistry, mm-hmm. and then saying, 
you know, can I kiss you? Maybe that's okay. But then, hey, you mind if I use my tongue? You mind if I do this? You mind yeah, if I do yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, she might not even want that. Well, I remember, right. well, exactly. I remember when I was in college and I said to her, I don't know if you, if the word parking, like, you know, go out parking, is that still a word these days? No. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like go to the drive-ins? Thanks, thanks you could have lied. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Throw me a bone here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so parking was like necking or, you know, oh, okay. or, or making out that type of thing and so I said to this woman that I was out with Iris I still remember her name because of her response and so I said we had a wonderful evening I said would you like to go parking and she goes Warren, you don't ask a woman if she wants to park. You park. If, uh, I don't want to, you know, this forces me into having to admit that I want to do this. You know, I want you to take the lead, take over. Right. If I if I don't want to park with you or I don't want to do something, I'll let you know. I just won't let you know in words. And so, and this is, of course, the dynamic that women um, have traditionally expected. And many, most women today, if a guy is, is coming around on a date and he has a, uh, you know, 11 different forms there for each set of intimacy just like you said this is going to be like really a turnoff yeah. um, because and the function of this historically has been if a woman says no um, for, first of all a woman felt that she wasn't respected if she didn't say some no's between eye contact and intercourse and given us guys you know with our testosterone um, if the woman didn't say no we'd be having intercourse within about 10 or 15 minutes at the most um, after the first um, hand holding and so the but the functions of the woman saying no was she discovered which guys how did how did a guy handle no's which gave her information about how does a how does a man as a future salesman handle mm. handle a no mm -hmm. does he the first no does he back off and you know not come back again and that's not a guy that's going to be a good provider on the other hand if he gets furious and upset and starts accusing her of things he's not going to be a good husband mm. and mm -hmm. so she got all this information that's important from feedback this, from this pro from this process but the feedback is dependent on on a, a mode of male-female connection, and that mode was that we as males are expected to risk, um, th we, we're expected to do the risking of sexual rejection. Women have the option of risking sexual rejection, but the ex expectation is still on our shoulders. And what I'm suggesting in the boy crisis and in other, you know, in the boy crisis in particular, is that this needs to change. If we want, you know, right now, virtually every entrepreneur, the common denominator of every entrepreneur is the willingness to take risks. Virtually every multi-millionaire or multi-billionaire um, entrepreneur that we know of that's self-made, that hasn't come from a background of wealth, um, is a male. And one of the reasons it's that the entrepreneurs who are billionaires and self-made are males is because we learn during all the vulnerable years of our life to be figure out how to take risks how to get rejection how to go back and you know come at it with persistence but with style and class or humor or mm. some combination of both that fits the mm. fits the occasion and that's what an entrepreneur needs mm. and so if we and so the women are complaining that uh, feminists are complaining that you know there aren't equal numbers of men uh, women in high places well one of the many reasons why there aren't is um, is because that they aren't trained in risk taking nearly as much as as, um, as guys are and so if women are going to say what they want they need to say what they want, not just in terms of veto power. They need to um, take responsibility and be accountable and take the risks of rejection and start being trained to do that at the ages of, of 14, 15, 16, when they start to begin to be interested in sex. Now, Dr. Farrell, do you think this is because, evolutionarily speaking, you know, I've heard scientists and anthropologists say that men, from an evolutionary standpoint, are disposable in the sense that you could have a society of a thousand women and a hundred men and that society would succeed and be okay. But if we flip that, <clears throat> it would never work just because men uh, can't, you know, bear children. But we can impregnate, you know, multiple women within mm -hmm. a short period of time. So it makes us, evolutionarily speaking, we were the ones that took the risks because we could die and yeah. we would be okay. So we would be the ones that would go hunt, which was very dangerous, or we would historically be the ones to die in battle and war mm -hmm. um, because you know if we died it was okay and so it's part of that it, it, would you say it's part of that evolutionary process where you know through cultures and through maybe even biology we're just 
we're supposed to be the ones that take risks for, for a long period of time. But now that we have a modern times, maybe it's changing because it's not as necessary. So you're putting your fingers on an extremely important issue, which is when I wrote the book, The Myth of Male Power, the subtitle of it was Why Men are the disposable sex. Oh wow! And so, um, and so this, this this so this gets us into a number of different really important areas. One is that we've been trained, historically speaking, to have heroic intelligence, and heroic intelligence is intelligence for a short life. Mm-hmm. Whereas the alternative to heroic intelligence is health intelligence, which is intelligence for a long life. And so, with heroic intelligence, we were trained to do things like associate the willingness to dispose of ourselves with being a hero like being a, a general in, a, in an army mm. and until recently until you know about 30 40 50 years ago um, almost all the presidency that uh, the, a very high percentage of the presidency that had United States had military background many of them were generals like general Eisenhower and um, and so we had a huge respect for men who managed to be willing to risk their lives and save us but who did survive the process. Um, and so part of the, what we did was give our boys social bribes and our parents, the parents wanted, wanted their son on the one hand to be safe, on the other hand, oh man, I'm so proud of him, he joined, he joined the Marines. Uh, look, here's a picture of him in his uniform. Doesn't he look great? And it's just like his dad and his grandpa, they all were top level Marines. And you know, and oh my goodness, not, he's only, not only did he join uh, the military, but he joined the special forces, you know, or he, you know, he joined um, um, some some elite group. So the word elite uh, was another s- social bribe to get him to be willing to risk his life at an even deeper and greater level. And so this is um, so all of this was training for heroic intelligence. And part of the way we train boys for heroic intelligence is at a very early age to get them as to associate their pre- preparation for their disposability uh, with being proud of themselves. And so we got them to play football. And we got the cheerleaders, the most attractive girls in the school, to say, first in 10, you know, risk a concussion again. Um, mm. you know, the, which it wasn't exactly the worst they said. <laughs> that would be a great cheer. <laughs> yeah, be great. And, and, which is C-T-E. Real, wait, yeah, C-T-E. <laughs> C-T-E. Very good. C-T-E. Yeah. Um, Everybody. No, yeah. uh, CTE, no longer will you be. <laughs> oh, this hurts me yeah. Yeah. a little bit. A little too close to home. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the, 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 and, you know, there was the cheerleaders never said, be careful there, be safe again. Uh, you, know, right. you know, make a plan that isn't so, um, so destructive to you. It was, you know, hit him again, hit him again, harder, harder, you know, which is basically, you know, hit him again, hit him again, concussion again type mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. And so we, we learned to assume associate the willingness to risk those concussions with um, with being a hero being yeah, honored. You know, and and the and the cheerleader would cheer for us and mm. and you know and, and we're you know 14 15 16 17 year old boys and we're looking at the you know, most beautiful women in the school you know kick their legs up and we see under their dress and they're the ones that are available to me if I'm willing to risk my you know mm. my life mm-hmm. and so those became the associations or what I call the social bribes that associated being willing to be disposable with being loved mm. Mm. And so women associate being loved with being cared for, attended to, bought gifts, um, you know, bought diamonds, pe- being paid for. We associate love with having to perform to get to, to be able to not only have the love of the woman, but to risk our lives and show that we're disposable to take a- and then to go ahead and uh, risk rejection and then to pay money Mm -hmm. and the more she's beautiful the more we're expected to take take her to a nice restaurant and you know every kiss begins with k now the the (laughs) result of this the now that you're saying this it makes perfect sense because the result of that if you if you stretch it out and extrapolate okay what would be the result of that of the societal pressures like that where the where the boys are encouraged to take these risks uh, with their lives, if you will, either symbolically or literally, mm-hmm. and with the you know the fact that the, that you're saying the the girls associate love with care and whatever, mm-hmm. what that ends up looking like is more extremely successful men, but also more men that have died at work, more work accidents, more maybe suicide, more you know the other type of risky behavior that may not be so. 
um, desirable, like jail or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does that is that make sense? Is that, that that's exactly the follow up on that? Okay. And so you know, men have learned that you know, all the all the hazardous jobs are ninety to one hundred percent males. Ninety three percent of the people who die in work in general are killed at work um, are males. Um, and so if there is a shortage of money, um, especially in inner city communities, you take an extra you take risks and sell drugs and and, and then you may kill off an opponent uh, that's trying to you know, uh, poach on your territory. And so that then gets you in jail to a much greater degree. Um, and so you're, you're the one that uh, makes the plan to rob the bank. You're the one that you know does something that's risky to earn money so you can get the car, get the drugs, get the reputation um, and 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 get a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, not the the only. It's not the only goal to get a woman, but it is one of the goals to get a woman to get the parental respect and to get your self respect. And so we have trained males to get self respect by not. So now here's the connection to health intelligence or the disconnection to health intelligence. If you're going to be prepared to be in the in in war and die. The, um, and and, a, and your first step is boot camp. And so at boot camp, let's say um, someone is Jewish, they're going to call that person you know, an anti-Semitic name. And the purpose of calling them an anti-Semitic name is so that they cannot be thrown off. Um, guard. They, you're training them to disconnect from their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and Or you're going to push them to, to, to um, do something that's very risky like in order to pre prepare themselves to be killed. I want to mm -hmm. interject there yes. because yes, sure. we've speculated we've on this. talked about this. <laughs> yes, because for anybody who's who's maybe not following along or maybe doesn't agree, I, I, you just look and see the way men tease each other and the, the nicknames that men give each other mm -hmm. yeah. versus the nicknames that like women... The worst nicknames we could possibly come up with. We are literally terrible to each other and we love it and laugh about it. You know, I, was, I tell the story all the time. I had a friend who had a restaurant and he was giving me a tour once mm -hmm. and he was introducing me to everybody. This is John, this is Susan, this is... And then he introduces me to someone he says, and, and this guy's name is Nine mm -hmm. and we keep walking and that, when I come back around, I said, Nine, I said, is that a German name? And Everybody starts laughing, and he says, <laughs> and he says, "Hey, show him why they call you nine. He holds his hands up, and he's missing a finger. Uh -huh. And yeah. that's a classic yes, way that yeah. men nickname each other. I don't think women call each other terrible nicknames as well. And you're saying it's because we're literally constantly testing each other. Well, we're t constantly testing each other, and we saw this as you know. I came into the studio this morning, and um, you had mentioned that it was uh, 17 years and 16 years and 15 years. And yeah. the first thing I did is said, "Oh, yeah. I could tell by the amount of t you know." You I pumped tell ass. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so we and were, I immediately we, liked you. After yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> even and, though you and, put me down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a way. Of, it was my way of saying, like, I find you guys. You know, I, I like you guys. I have. The, I like your energy, and we we bond through. That you know, with covered put downs, mm -hmm. and anyone that can't hand that, we don't trust. And the reason we don't trust, so if, if we're in, we're firefighters, let's say, and all the hazardous professions, the more hazardous the profession, the more the 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 um, the commerce of the the male in the ha hazardous profession is the trading of wit covered put downs. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, let's say. Um, I'm a firefighter, and the son of the fire chief um, who graduates from Harvard is coming in. Well, I'm not sure that that son of the fire chief that graduated from Harvard is going to risk his life to save mine. And so I imagine that, and uh, that if there's a, if we go into a house and a, and the roof falls in, and I'm trapped underneath um, that, um, that that guy is not is I'm not sure he's going to risk his life to to save me. And so if he's a prima donna. I have to I have to worry if he's a guy that can sort of like be um, put down, who can handle criticism, who can go with the flow. He's far 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 more likely, I sense, to be willing to risk his life because he doesn't treat himself so seriously, mm -hmm. and um, he's he's willing to be one of he's willing to be part of a team uh, that can that can do that be self-effacing mm. and so now the trouble comes and this is you know the the original question was why was i protested because all of these things we all know are true i mean all of us guys know are true and thoughtful women know that are are true but but the feminist community that i was a part of that i was on the board of directors of the national organization the only for, man i think one of the only men uh, ever ever elected three times to the board mm -hmm. of now in new york city and so i'm a very deep supporter of true women's liberation 
But when women's liberation, uh, when feminism created a basic ideology that said the world is a patriarchal world that is uh, where the rules are made by men to benefit men at the expense of women, that completely misunderstood the role of men. When men do earn more money than women, but not men in general, dads earn more money than wives do, than mothers do. And they start earning more money than mothers do because they increase their obligations and their responsibilities when they become dads. So we give up doing the things we want to do, like teaching, which is a passion, or being an artist, which is a passion. Um, and when you have children, you give those things up to do things that make money. So you give up being that teacher and you become an administrator. You give up um, t um, be a being able to come home every night to see your children and see to see your family, and you become a national sales representative instead of a local sales representative. Do you, and because we make more money as a local sales representative, or we drive an Uber uh, 60 hours a week, uh, the feminist community says, see, on average, men earn more money. And they imply that men earn more money for the same work. But when I wrote a book called Why Men Earn More and What Women Can Do About It, I found that there are, in fact, 25 measurable difference, differences between what men do to earn more money and what women do. And when women do those same things, they actually earn more than their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And we see that as you dig deeper, that, that women who have never been married, who have never had children, earn 117% of what men who have never been married and never have children earn. Mm. And this is c controlling for a number of years, work, age, and, um, and education. Now, let me, let me comment on that because I'm going to make it a, 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 a speculation, um, and this is just me guessing, but I'm guessing it's because knowing myself, I'm a father and having friends that became dads. When men become dads, the first thing that we think is, I need to make more money, I need to bust my ass, I need to get serious. Right. Women think that when they don't have kids. Okay, I don't have kids, I don't have family, I need to bust my ass and make a lot of money, and maybe they're doing it because of their career. When women tend to have children, what I've, what I've seen is they tend to value flexibility in their work, wanting to spend more time with their kids. This is obviously traditional uh, stereotype, but I think it, 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 it's probably true more often than not. Am I, am I off? Or? No, you're 100% ex on. This is exactly what I found when I did the, the research for why men earn more. And, it's, and these are all things that women can do. So, um, so, and you see this particularly, many women say, well, you know, bosses have a stereotype of women, and so they feel that when a woman's going to have a child that she's going to be less devoted to her um, to her kids or to her work uh, to her work and this is uh, and it turns out that this is actually quite accurate so women who have master's degrees MBAs who start their own business earn only 49% of what men earn who start their own business because and why when we asked the men what they wanted out of starting their own business, 76% said their first priority was to earn money. Women's first priority, by their own acknowledgement, was to have flexibility, exactly what you said, was to be able to be close to home, to be near the children, to, to, be, to be able to have free time, to be their own boss, uh, to be fulfilled. Mm. Um, and then, down the scale, about number five, was to earn money. Mm -hmm. And so... The, the importance of that statistic is that women who own their own businesses have no bosses to discriminate against them. It's their so own. It's their own choices. And your original point about the women who have never been married and never had children, you're exactly right. When a woman senses that she wants, a, um, she's not going to be married and not have children, she doesn't sense that she's going to have somebody else to support support her. So she goes out there and makes a good living and does very well. And she gets promoted more quickly than her male counterpart even in the 500 top um, companies in, in, the, in the country. I think it's important to note, too, that uh, the important thing is that people have the freedom to choose whatever direction they want to go. And when you look at the societies with the most egalitarian type uh, policies, like some of the Scandinavian countries, you actually find that the disparity between the jobs that men and women choose are even greater. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they're being forced, it's because they tend to like and choose different things. They have the freedom mm -hmm. to choose different things. Women have as much a freedom to choose to 
you know, work 80 hours a week and be CEO and men have just as much right, you know, freedom to choose to stay at home. Mm-hmm. Um, but they stay even more so choose the different things. And what they actually found in some other data that I read was that the, the, the more, uh, the more difficult uh, circumstances were, the more likely women were to seek out jobs that made more money and you saw a smaller gap, mainly mainly because they kind of had to. But once things were more prosperous and they had more freedom to choose to, to be at home, um, that tends to be more often than not what they choose to do and the men more often than not choose the responsibility of being the breadwinner. And I don't see why this is a, a, a bad thing necessarily. Hmm. Now, the, now, you were in the feminist, you were part of the now uh, you know uh, group um, and that was back in the seventies, I believe, right? Yes, correct. It, it, has feminism changed since mm. then? Because I keep hearing people talk about third wave feminism and how it's changed. And what were they fighting for before? And what what's different about it now? When when I started my work with the feminist movement, um, uh, Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan used to both say pretty much the same thing. Gloria Steinem put it in these words: "What the world needs is more women at work and more men at home, um, and more men as, as dads." Mm. And I agreed with that because I, what what I what my belief was at the beginning is that we have mastered survival enough in developed countries to be able to allow people the freedom to be who they want to be, to be human beings rather than human doings. Mm. Um, we, we men were never trained to be human beings. We were trained to be human do- doings. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm an author. I'm a, a soldier. I'm, you know, and so we, we knew that if we were to be worth anything as a man, um, we, we, no, no woman was going to marry a, a guy who's, you know, he's unemployed, but I love the books he reads, um, mm-hmm. you know, and so he's very thoughtful and sensitive and caring and warm, um, but I don't think he's going to earn any money. Um, so I'm going I'm to marry him because mm-hmm. he's really sensitive and warm. And so we all knew this and women knew this and, you know, women among themselves are very specific about they want, you know, I'll give me a salary man is what the way they put it in Japan, you know, or, you know, find me a man that's wealthy, which, what is he do what does he do Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're basically we were trained to be human doings and so um, but so as a feminist movement evolved two things happened well lots of things happened but two of the things that happened is one of the one was that there was a there was a higher we evolved out of the civil rights movement um, which in which there was an oppressor and an oppressed there was a slave owner and a slave uh, that we evolved from. So there was a clear hierarchy of oppressor and oppressed. And then the early part of feminism, a good portion of it, was Marxist feminism. And, Len- and Lenin believed that the, the um, nuclear family was set up to be oppressive to women. Mm. Um, and so the, the feminist movement grew out of another oppressor versus oppressed. It was Marxist feminism. You had the oppressor class and the oppressed. And so we, since we earned more money, men did, we were considered akin to the oppressor class. And so that and that was the fault of us as feminists. We assumed that because men earned more money, it was about male privilege or male power. We didn't understand that the road to high pay is a toll road. And when you become a dad, you're willing to make those tolls because you care more about your children not having to pay those tolls in the future. So walkouts, you know, if we wanted to go from here to the airport, any airport, we would probably call Uber or Lyft. And 90% of those drivers are going to be males, not because they have male privilege, but because they have male obligations to support families and they and and anybody can become an Uber driver. And the men do it more frequently than the women because mm. they have more obligations once they have children uh, and or they're planning to be they're single and they're wanting to have enough money saved up so that they can be valued enough to be able to um, ask women out and pay for women and so what what the women's movement did is started gender courses all over the world and through and so when the men earn more money they immediately call that power and privilege rather than calling that I, I am so appreciative of men uh, for when the children come and women that we that we try to create options for our wives to be with the children or not with the children and so we have in this current moment we have four when men and women have children 40 percent of women do not work outside the home at all 
Forty percent of the of women work full time, which is thirty five hours a week or more, and twenty percent work part time. So women have the choice of working full time, children full time, or some combination of both. But and men have three choices too. Option one is to work full time. Option two is to work full time, and option three is to work full time.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's considered male privilege. Do we know what the statistics are of how many men work full time when they have children versus how many men who stay at home? Yes, it's about. Let's see. I think of the of among the people who stay at home, it's about six or seven percent males、um, who stay at home full time,、mm. um, and so that. But there's some. Men and women who don't stay home at all, where both you know, people work. Now, now I do see that the early, you know, feminist movement or women's movement, you know, was addressing some some real issues that needed to be addressed, right?、Yes. Like、mm-hmm. voting. There were laws where women couldn't do certain things without their husband's consent. Societally speaking,、uh, women uh, were, you, you know, if they did anything outside of what a woman was supposed to do. Um, it was, you know, the the pressures were were terrible, and they weren't given necessarily the freedoms to be whatever they wanted to be or do whatever they want. So I could definitely see the the value in that,、um, but that kind of movement never really has happened for men, where we feel that same kind of freedom. Right, and so the two parts of what you said are very important because women did not have freedom, neither did men.、Mm. And so the、mm. uh, our parents did not go around talking about. Well, I'll give you an example. My father, when I started、um, uh, in in high school, I, I I started taking an interest in writing. So I wanted to go to the、uh, the the public library to sort of do some research for my book. And my father said, "No, you you have to you know you have to you have to take care of、uh, weeding and mowing the lawn and taking care of all these things." By the time I got finished with my chores, I had maybe a half a day a week to be able to go to the library. And that's about what he allowed. And so when I wanted to write my first book, he said, "Warren, well, first of all, when I wanted to get a PhD, he, he would say to me, 'Warren, maybe you should get not a PhD but a JOB,' <laughs> you know, and, because he was fearful that I would try to do something like be an author. And he knew accurately that about 99% of authors, you know, just don't make it as authors. It's a very, very、mm-hmm. challenging、um, way to make a living.、Mm-hmm. If you if you don't have a family, yes, you could be an author, and you know, you could live off a small amount of money. But、um, so he was warning me right from the beginning. It was not until I got my third book contract of more than a hundred thousand dollars that he said, "Okay, I see. Maybe you can make it as an author,"、mm. because he was training me to be responsible. Um, and so, not to have choice, and so I was not. I didn't feel free. And you know, if you look at the the bio, biographies of Picasso or almost anybody who's an、uh, artist, almost all of their fathers and mothers were saying, you, "This is not responsible for a male to do."、Uh, mm-hmm. You can, unless you came from a wealthy family,、uh, you could not be、uh, an art、uh, and something. You could not do what you wanted to do. You had to do what you had to do.、Mm-hmm. That was the job of a man.、Mm-hmm. And the feminist movement has taken that oblig that set of obligations on men, and turned because it led to men earning more money, so their children could do better and not have to earn more money and have more options in their lifetime. It took that set of willingness to be able to support our family. Uh, the male obligation, and it turned that into oh, you earn more money, therefore you have more rights,、mm. therefore you dominate.、Mm. So, how do you feel about this current movement to dissolve gender roles? I, th- I think it's wonderful to dissolve gender obligations. Obligations. That is, the obligations from. The, so, in other words, I've always been in favor of what I call gender liberation, and that's liberation from the rig- rigid roles of the past to more flexible roles for the future for both men. So, we'll have some boys that that will sort of naturally be, you know, want to do things that are higher risk taking and that are that are、um, you know that that. That go to go to the military to be firefighters and so on, and if that boy chooses that,、um, because with knowing of the risks and chooses to play football, knowing of the risks, great. But let's see now if he's playing football at age eight, is that something that he's consented to? Or has he picked up a desire to sort of what is what are his motivations, and the job of us as parents are to sort of talk through our children's motivations and make sure that their motivations are not based on, I think I'll be more liked or be more loved, I'll be more respected, and and I, and therefore be a victim of what I call social bribes.、Um, it's to 
think through what they want for themselves in their life. My father would, I was this, the only strong part of my myself as a as a human being physically is as my legs and I, when I was in high school I was able to kick very far um, but my fa- I was a hundred yet I was 149 pounds and six foot one and my father said you if you're a good kicker you'll be tackled and mangled mm. and so my father prevented me from from doing that kicking which I didn't like at the time but I'm glad he's probably saved by self in a significant way and so we um, he helped me to, in, in his case, he didn't give me the option when I was in high school to think that through because he knew that I would choose adulation over um, you know o- over a common sense um, preservation of my body. And he just made clear, listen, you're a student body president, you have enough respect, give other people a chance to have some respect. Mm-hmm. It was his way of you know doing right. It. So I talk about on the show a lot that you know as humans, we tend to do this when, because I agree with you that the dissolving of gender roles is a good thing. But one of the things I, I talk a lot about is that we tend to swing from one side and then we go the opposite extreme. Do you see any of that happening right now with, with the dissolving of the gender roles? Is there anything to worry about? I, yes. Well, first of all, I don't approve of dissolving of gender roles just because, to, you know, I don't b- b- believe in parenting by saying, listen, I don't want you to do what's natural if, if what's natural for you um, happens to be a, a gender role orientation. So it is not freedom to be told you can't do something. You can't do your male role. You can't do your female role. It is freedom to to sort of help parents to help think through. um, Well, first of all, it's important for parents to do the type of boundary enforcement that then trains children to have postponed gratification, which then trains the child to be able to accomplish whatever she or he wishes to do. Mm. So she doesn't have to, she or he doesn't have to wish, doesn't have to resort to getting approval, but out of the few competences it may naturally have, but once you know how to, how to do what you, how to do what you need to do, how to achieve a goal, if you have a dream, let's say to be a gymnast, but your father and mother, every time you said, I want ice cream, Mm -hmm. and your father and mother said, well, you can have ice cream after you finish your peas, but then you had a few peas, and then your father and mother said, well, okay, you had a few peas, that's good enough, Um, now you can have your ice cream. You learn to manipulate a better deal, and you don't learn to finish doing what you have to do, your peas, to get what you want to do, your ice cream. Therefore, your goal of becoming a gymnast cannot be achieved because you haven't learned the discipline of doing what you need to do to be a great gymnast or a great football player or a great scholar or a great at anything. So no matter what your dream is when you're a kid, you cannot fulfill it. That's if you don't have postponed gratification. And you don't get postponed gratification without a par- parents enforcing boundaries. Mm. And parents enforcing boundaries, oftentimes mothers will say you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. Mm. And then, the, the, then the, the, especially if the mother and father are divorced, the mom will say, well, gee, you know, the, the kid has gone through a divorce. He's having a, you know, he's really feeling badly. He was bullied today. And he'll, she'll find some reason to say, okay, sweetie, I'll tell you what, have a few more peas and then you can have your ice cream. So the kid learns, ah, with mom, I can manipulate a better deal. Mm-hmm. With dad, he's much more likely or she's much more likely to hear, um, excuse me, we have a deal here. The deal is you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. And so the, the kid goes, you're so mean. Um, and dad goes, you can cry about being my being mean too and then there'll be no more ice cream tomorrow night either (laughs) and so so the kid with dad was much more likely to go all right the only way i'm going to get this ice cream here is to finish my peas so children raised by dads primarily are only 15 percent likely to have adhd children raised by Mm. moms are 30 percent likely to have adhd and one of the reasons for that is that the children um, raised by, by dads learn that they have to focus their attention on doing what they have to do, mm-hmm. otherwise they don't get what they want to do. And we as dads do this through things like roughhousing as well. Yes. Um, we, with roughhousing, we create a bond. And that bond is, um, is 
makes kids okay, less less resentful about doing something that we say that they need to do. Like, okay, you, we'll do some roughhousing until nine, um, eight eight thirty. Then you have to get completely ready for bed. Bedtime is nine fifteen. And if you get if you get completely ready with your homework and you know chores, etc., um, by nine o'clock, we'll have from nine to nine fifteen to do anything you want, including roughhousing. Mother goes, "What? You must be kidding! You can't get the kids mm. riled up before bed." You know, and she's also going when she sees. My mom and dad roughhousing like you know uh, do you not realize here that sooner or later somebody's going to get hurt yeah. sooner or later somebody's going to you know inevitably uh, somebody cries and inevitably somebody cries and so mom is going i feel like with dad i i have only one more child to i have to monitor <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so and then but dad but dads don't read the boy crisis or anything else on parenting to learn that there's about 10 differences between dad style parenting and mom style yeah. parenting and each of dad styles parenting have two things in common they, they help children enormously and dads don't know how they help children and so <laughs> yeah, yeah. and so, and moms can't hear what dads don't say and so just taking the rough housing example um, very few dads will say you know when i rough house here are some of the outcomes for the children mm-hmm. a they learn a greater amount of empathy. Empathy? Yeah. You must be effing kidding. You know, how could you have roughhousing be associated with empathy? And here's how. The, let's say John and Jimmy and Jane, uh, you know, th- brothers and sisters, and they're all, and, and the game is to, um, is to pin down dad in a wrestling match and dad versus dad pinning the three of them down in the wrestling match. And so dad throws the three of them on the couch and the, and the three kids jump off the couch all trying to be the kingpin. And, pin, uh, and so in the process of being this kingpin, um, Johnny pushes Jimmy aside and, um, and J- Jimmy pushes Janie aside. And so dad said, whoops, I'm sorry, you can pin me down, but you can't push the other one aside. You can't poke them with the elbow mm. and so on. All right, all right, daddy, oh, let's go back to the rough housing. And so they go back to the rough housing, and mom's watching this, and and um, and sooner or later, uh, with a hundred percent likelihood of prediction, pr- prediction, prediction, somebody will hurt themselves, or somebody will end up crying, or somebody will end up angry and and hitting hit, hitting the other one. And so mom is feeling guilty that you know that dad is doing all of this. And there's uh, and 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 then the kids did cry just like she mm. predicted in her mind, and she feels guilty she didn't proactively intervene first. And dad is uh, and then dad returns to the roughhousing after some of the crying, and he she has no idea that dad why dad could, should be so insensitive into as to return to the exact same process that led the kids to hurt themselves. Mm. And here's what happens in the process that dads don't explain um, by. Returning to the roughhousing, he he has told the kids what they can't do, mm-hmm. and then he's given them a chance to try it out again. Yeah, and so he's training them to have emotional intelligence under fire to know when it's when you're going right. too hard or when you're going hard enough. When exactly. I can hit, when you when can I... assert yourself, and what is actually like violence. Right? Precisely, what's mm-hmm. the gap? And so the children who do a lot of roughhousing, aside from having a much deeper bond with parents and being much more willing to do what the parents say because they're going to return to fun and get more fun, they learn exactly what you just said, which is what is being assertive and what is being aggressive. Now, mom and dad can explain to the kids what is being assertive and being aggressive, or wait, can they? Or they can experience mm. it. They can experience it, exactly. Mm. And so, uh, because you cannot explain intellectually what is being assertive mm. versus being especially aggressive. To a child. I love that you talk yeah, about this. Yes. Yeah, because yes. this is, is definitely something you don't see a lot in schools. Like, yeah. and, and I found a good school that actually had rough and tumble play. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was, it was brilliant that the, that the teacher actually did the research and saw that psychologically this really helps not just boys, but also girls as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. It helps girls as well. And the, the when you don't, and so one of the sig- big differences between, you know, where does the boy crisis reside? Um, there's 10 causes of the boy crisis, but the single biggest cause is lack of father invi- involvement. Basically, the boy crisis resides where fathers do not reside. I have a question about that because, you know, we're talking about, um, earlier we were talking about the, the feminist movement and what it was trying to do, which was to give girls and women 
the freedom to be whatever they wanted. Uh, boys and men didn't necessarily experience that same type of growth. And and, a, and you're saying a lot of it was driven behind this this uh, you know paradigm that the men or males are the oppressor and, and girls or women are the you know the people being oppressed. And over time, understanding that and viewing society that way, I could see how public policy and attitudes started treating girls as, oh no, you're the oppressed one. We need to do everything we can to help you. You're the oppressor's boy, so we need to kind of ignore you and not worry about it. And then you come out with laws that, you know, um, uh, that, that uh, you know, give single moms lots of benefits, for example, not so much to, to, to single dads, or pushing policies that give mothers the ability to take the children and do what they want through divorce, whereas the men have. And by the way, statistically speaking, uh, if you're a, if you're a father and you get divorced and you go to court, you're in the, and she fights for custody and you guys have a, a fight. Uh, the odds are she'll win if somebody wins. She's yeah, th- yeah. those are the odds because we viewed things that way. Mm-hmm. Has what else has that caused as a result? Because I know single parenthood is is exploded and often more often than not it's men that are not uh, that are not there. By the way, I think some of that is also to blame for men. I think men do more often than not. Um, uh, feel like they can maybe just leave and they don't have the same pressure to stick around. Um, but there's also things like in the classroom. Classrooms have changed quite a bit where um, they seem to be catered more towards towards girls and female type mm-hmm. intelligence versus boys. Mm-hmm. Is that all Is that all true? Am I making no, correct statements? Every, every th- as, as in the past, every single thing you've said are, is, is well-informed and right on okay, and, okay. And, and, and hitting the, some of the most important points. The um, and the the really important underlying point that you just put your finger on is once we started from the assumption that it's males are oppressors and women are the oppressed, then everything we did for women, we couldn't do enough. Mm. Um, and so that began to get women to be entitled and feel that if they so for example we have the hashtag Me Too movement now, and hashtag Me Too is wonderful that women are speaking up and explaining what's bothering them. However, hashtag Me Too is also extraordinarily sexist because any change in the male-female dance, the tango that men and women do, needs to have both sexes speaking up. Mm-hmm. If you ch- you have a tango, uh, women attract, resist. Men pursue, persist. That's the basic male-female tango, the traditional Mm -hmm. male-female tango. And if you're going to change part of that tango because somebody doesn't like it, then the entire tango, by definition, has to change. And so if you don't have um, males saying, well, here's the part of the tango I like, here's the part of the tango I don't like, here's the way it feels to me, and how's it, how does it feel to you, we're not training people to do exactly what we need to do, which is to communicate with each other and hear each other's pain and feelings. So for years, maybe 20 years, I went around the world and I, I conducted, I wanted to get men and women to understand each other. And to do that, I had, I conducted, uh, I said to every man in the audience, um, every woman is in a beauty contest every day of her life. Guys, if you want to be in the beauty experience, the beauty contest of everyday life that women go through, come up on stage and be in this beauty contest. And so I'd have maybe, in those days, I was much more popular uh, before I started speaking <laughs> out against some of these things that I'm talking <laughs> about now. And so I, I got, maybe I usually had four or five hundred guys in the audience that would come up on stage and in the aisles and be in this beauty contest. And I'd have all the women be the judges in the beauty contest of <laughs> everyday life. And the guys competed to win pretty ferociously um, but the ones that got to be the t- top six finalists when I interviewed them later they uh, when you know in front of the entire audience they said man I was on the one hand competing to be seen as the best looking guy and on the other hand the way I was being treated was that nothing about me was at all of value except my looks mm. and I have a lot of important things to me I have my values I have you know um, my integrity I'm a pretty good student I'm this and that I'm more than just a body and I I'm, and now I'm seeing that when I only focus on women physically which I tend to do I'm sort of leaving out a lot that um, that would be really wonderful for me to um, focus on and I can see why the woman feels often resentful so then i'd have i said this is role reversal so the women's turn now 
was to risk sexual rejection with a man. So I, I've calculated that there's typically about 100, 100 risks of sexual rejection between eye contact and intercourse. And so I had just the women do the first few. The first thing I persuaded the women to do was to compete for the man that they were most attracted to. So oftentimes there was you know, 11 or 12 women competing for the winner of the beauty contest who now had both status and physical attractiveness. Oh. And, mm. and then uh, about six or seven women competing for the other finalists. And the women, after the, I had them just ask the guy out, get it, uh, be the one to win to ask the guy out, and then at least hold the man's hand and at least kiss him on the cheek. That was all that was required. And and, I, and the man's re requirement was to not not be too easy. Um, and so, <laughs> real hard for us to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that it's in, a real task. That indeed was yeah. a tougher challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when the women came back and they said, um, every time in my life when I have used the word jerk, I have to admit that it was a man that I was talking about. But tonight... I was the jerk. Mm. I was the one that um, said to the man that I, I you know, I, I, I was doing a better um, occupation uh, than I actually was. Uh, that I had better prospects than I than I actually do, probably. Uh, that I have a better car than I could actually materialize. Um, I was. I promised to take them to a restaurant that I can't afford, you know, and that type of thing. And then I physically took him by the hand because I wasn't winning and I pulled him away from the other women. Now that was usually the woman that won that guy. Mm. Um, and so it, it, that she physically took over the situation. And she said, man, I acted like a royal jerk. I was a liar. I was physically aggressive. I didn't, you know, I didn't allow the women, I, I didn't even think about allowing the women an equal opportunity to speak up. Um, and so, um, and they really got, you know, the, the, the pressures on their role. And so my desire in male-female issues has been to say, to, to say both sexes have roles that leave them feeling badly about themselves in different ways. And hashtag me too should be about a sharing of how that happens and what we want to change about it and where we want to have options and where we want to still have roles and so on. Let's have a good dialogue. And in order to have a good dialogue, we have to have one thing which is the ability to hear each other's perspectives without becoming defensive because mm -hmm. the Achilles heel of human beings is our inability to handle personal criticism uh, without becoming defensive. Mm -hmm. And so I see that the reason I do communication workshops around the country is because I see that as being more important to solving these problems than any other single thing. Wow, it's, it's as if we are far That's more amazing. complex than we think we are, and we try to uh, simplify everything and say, oh, that's good and that's bad, not realizing that there's much more much more to the story. Exactly, you know? Ex exactly right, and, and this is why I am protested, mm -hmm. um, because I am, I am confronting and challenging the belief that it's women good and men bad. Mm -hmm. you, you've also, I've heard you, and correct me if I'm saying it wrong, but I think you addressed it this way. I think somebody was talking about Black Lives Matter, and you said uh, it should be Boys Lives Matter. Yes. Explain that. Yes, so when a, a, black, a policeman, a white policeman or a black policeman kills, uh, shoots somebody, he's 24 times more likely to shoot a male than a female. So the um, he's only uh, he's slightly more, only slightly more likely to shoot a black person than a white person, but when the when he shoots uh, he, when the police officer shoots someone, it is the, the 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 ratio of male versus female far exceeds the ratio of black versus non-black. Now is this controlling hmm. for like um, similar circumstances because men do commit more crimes than women. So is it controlling for, in other words, both people have a knife, one's a man, one's a woman, much more likely to shoot the man type of deal? Or are they controlling for those types of things? Let's see, it's the, um, that I'm not sure of. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the chances are probably not. Okay. Uh, but the, um, the I, I think for me the takeaway here is that the role you play as a male 
that is more likely to have you do the robbing of a house to you to you to you to be in a fight with another gang leader in order to get more drugs or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. The role you play as a male is likely to lead you to have that I gun, see. that knife, I see. and then be in that victim role. And you need to re-examine that role um, more than you and and look at the, the impact of that, the sexism of the role, rather than the racism. Only, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, the racism is a s- much smaller um, d- uh, com- uh, uh, contributor to the um, to that shooting. Interesting, yeah, because uh, you know I think there are some biological drivers, but I think there's also the, the societal ones, and I think you're right. I mean, um, you know, when it comes to risky behaviors, including the risky behaviors that that are breaking the law, which is a risky behavior, mm-hmm, uh, because we're we're more likely to, to to do risky things we're probably more mm-hmm. likely to, to 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 break laws and place ourselves in, in those types of situations um the we've gone through god in the last maybe 50 years or so an explosion in single parent households most of which are um you know father absent so there's no dads uh, in the home and we've now gone through at least a couple generations of that where, where we can start to see the result of that, you know, uh, of, of generations, one or two generations being, you know, raised in a house without a father. What are the consequences that we're seeing from that? Mm. The cons- there's nothing that is more important than th- that question and the answer to that question, first of all. I found that um, children, um, boys, were doing worse in all 63 of the largest developed nations. Developed nations had in common their ability, uh, the permission for divorce and permission for women to have children without being married. So in the United States at the present moment, 53% of all women under 30 who have children have children without being married. Ones where they're not even living with a man, the man is almost never involved um, with the the children, even from the beginning. Uh, The ones where they are living with the man, uh, that smaller percentage um, the, the, that man, the, the f- children are likely to not have father involvement after age three, three and a half to four in that um, area. Okay. And so the great majority of father absence is among children born to women who aren't married and among children who are um, who have experiencing the outcomes of divorce. Okay. And so... If, if you're a, a woman or a man listening to this and you're contemplating getting a divorce, there are four things that you can do to minimize the impact on children. I'm so, divorced, so I'm very interested uh, in hearing oh, okay. this. Yeah. Uh, those four things are that there's an, a, an equal, after divorce, that there's an equal amount of time that the children have with both the mother and father. Second is that the children, that the mother and father not be more than about 20 minutes of drive time from each other so the children don't have to give up an activity or a friend's birthday or uh, in order to go to the other parent's house and therefore resent the, 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 parents, the okay. parent that, whose home they're going to. Third, that the child is not able to, to hear or detect any bad mouthing from mom to dad or dad to mom. Because when the, child, when the other parent is being criticized, the child is half of the other parent. And so the child doesn't art, isn't able to articulate that when you're criticizing dad or criticizing mom, Criticize that you, them. you're criticizing them. And so and that is one of the most underappreciated dimensions of child abuse um, that um, in the culture. And then fourth, uh, that mom and dad have um, consistent relationship counseling um, uh, not just emergency-based relationship counseling, um, so that when you have only emergency-based re- relationship counseling, everything is so compressed and you have to make the decision fast, and you tend to only the, you only treat the other parent as, that's typical of you, you made that decision for this reason or that mm-hmm. reason, whereas when you have a longer term, not such an emergency-based counseling, uh, you can start, f- start seeing the best intent of, your par- of your, the divorce partner's strategy. And when children have all four of those conditions are met, they do almost as well as they do in an intact family. Okay. However, boys suffer considerably more from any type of relationship breakup than girls do. We, this is counterintuitive. Interesting. So, they, so when the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, for example, moved thousands of families to, um, from a poor neighborhood to a wealthier neighborhood with a better, better school system. 
and under the uh, belief that you know that poverty was part of the problem that you know that hurt children so much, and they wanted to give children a fair chance. Well, the girls in the new neighborhood ended up doing very well. The boys in the new neighborhood did worse uh, as a rule. Uh, they were more likely to be depressed. They didn't, um, they, they, it seemed like they were going to do much better because they'd say, okay, Jimmy, you know, I'll, I'll see you again. No problem, no problem. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, without, you know, sort of crying it out and stuff like that. And then they got into the new neighborhood and they weren't able to adjust. They missed the people that they, they were so used to uh, to a greater degree because the emotional skill sets and nuances of knowing how to reintegrate was less for boys than for girls. So they had fewer outlets for their, their grief and the sorrow. And, um, and they, they sought less support and they got less support in part because they sought less support and in part because we don't expect mm. to give boys more support. So in other words, we, we boys are encouraged to uh, not cry out or say I'm sad as much as girls are and we're, we tend to be viewed as tougher. Exactly. So they just don't get as much help. Precisely. Okay. And, the, and you know, part of what I say in, in both the myth of male power and, and in the boy crisis is that men's weakness is our facade of strength. And this is true not only with males, but it's also true with um, um, with animals, from from insects to birds to um, to all animals. So, for example, here's a really fun example: um, among buck elks, um, the uh, uh, among all insects and birds and animals, um, about 85 percent of the procreation comes from the females procreating with the perceived alpha male. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to be an alpha buck elk, you have to have the biggest um, rack, and to get, um, and then to get, but to get that biggest rack, you have to uh, you have to exhaust about thirty to thirty five percent of your minerals, calcium, and nutri nutrients from your body. So you are the apparent alpha strongest male, but mm -hmm. in fact you are the weakest male. So weak that if the buck elk doesn't get rid of his rack immediately after the mating period, he's in great jeopardy of dying from malnutrition before the winter sets mm. in um, and there's not enough nutrients to replenish mm. his nutrients. Interesting. So the, 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 what is considered his strength is real um, is really his facade of weakness. So um, men's weakness is our facade of. I'm sorry, his facade of strength mm. um, is. So men's weakness is their facade of strength, whether it's the buck elk or among us as um, as males in other ways. And I'm sure you see this in like bodybuilding. In, in bodybuilding, yes, right? yeah, yes. I could totally see you, you know the parallel there. Yes. Oh yeah, when they're on yeah. stage and they look the most ripped and whatever, they're the weakest because right. they're so depleted. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the some some of the the consequences of of you know lots of kids and especially boys being raised without fathers? What are the what do we what do the statistics show? I have in the Boy Crisis book 70 areas that boys who are dad-deprived are hurt. Um, mm. So boys who are dad-deprived, I was mentioning before, are much less likely to have that rough housing, that connection, that bond. Um, girls who are dad-deprived are much less likely to have that as well. It manifests in girls differently than in boys. So the rough housing, for example, um, gives a girl an opportunity to be um, physically close to someone she can trust and um, and not feel that the, any, being physically close with a male means automatically being sexual. Oh, fascinating. Um, and so girls who don't have fathers are far more likely to be pregnant out of wedlock um, and, and then later you know regret it because they feel like they want to keep a hold of the boy, but they don't know all the nuances of how to do that. Um, so they, but they do know one thing that they can keep a hold of him by being sexual with him, especially if Jane might be, mm. and she and she you know, might be rejected because she's not going to be sexual. Mm. She doesn't have other avenues of doing that. Or alternatively, they're so afraid of male intimacy that they can't connect and be in intimate and open to begin with, and mm. so they tend to um, uh, err on both sides of the spectrum. Interesting. Um, but so boys um, are damaged in by being um, less able to complete tasks and therefore less able to do their homework effectively. Therefore, they do worse. Boys who have are dad deprived do worse in every single ad academic subject than. Um, so if you look at um, children in a good school system without a dad, 
they do worth, worse in math and science, especially the boys do, than children in a poor school system with a dad and, and in a poor community. Mm. Um, it, it when, and here's maybe a perfect metaphor for uh, the difference between what happens to boys and girls. So let me, I'll just m- give you a, a few of the list of mm-hmm. things of you know, maybe five or six of the 70. Uh, children um, without dads, especially boys, um, boys without dads the, is the number one predictor of suicide is not having father involvement. The number one predictor of uh, committing crime is not having father involvement. Mm. Uh, the number one predictor of dropping out of high school is lack of father involvement. Uh, when you drop out of high school um, as, and you're a male, um, if, and you're in your 20s, uh, the unemployment rate is more than 20%. The underemployment rate is a great majority of the rest of, mm. of um, the boys who drop out of high school. Um, the um, much more likely to be depressed um, and much more likely to withdraw into video games and become video game addicted. A certain amount of video game playing is actually good for the brain, um, but the, at the addiction level, which is usually 13, 14 hours or more per week, and the video games alone, as this is not all electronics, just video games, uh, you start moving toward addiction. And the average boy plays 13 hours of video mm. games per week. But it's not uh, delayed gratification, right? Precisely. It's very it's much immediate, impulsive. Uh, yeah. Precisely. The, the enti- you put your finger right on it. The entire video game industry is serving immediate gratification. Now, some parts of some games are delayed gratification, and um, but there is um, like Zelda. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it takes forever. Yeah. It takes, uh, yeah. um, so the so but there but the, the addiction of uh, to video games is of course the problem. Um, and when boys don't do, um, when boys, as a result of not having dads, don't learn the postponed gratification, they can't do their homework well, they can't ex- succeed in sports, they can't exceed, uh, succeed um, in weightlifting without the steroids or additional mm-hmm. things to help them. Um, and so they don't get the respect of girls, women, teachers, or, and they start feeling ashamed of themselves. So when it comes to boy-girl time, um, they find that the girls are more interested in the winners than the losers, and they're a loser. And so they start withdrawing into video porn. Uh, mm. v- a video porn addicts. The, so what? What do guys get out of porn? It's we get access to a variety of attractive women, uh, without fear of rejection. Without fear of rejection is the important thing, at a price that you can afford. And so, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the combination of all of that uh, leaves the boy. Uh, he he gets turned on by a certain sexual scenario, but then the next time it doesn't turn him on as much because there's not as much dopamine released by that same scenario being repeated. So he needs to go to riskier and riskier scenarios. So when he finally does attract a woman to his bed, she feels like an object um, and like, you know, wait, we want me to do this risky stuff in this way and why, you know, mm-hmm. you want me to have anal intercourse and you want to come over my face and like, um, I know I really don't want to do that and I feel really objectified. And right, so, this is only my second time. <laughs> this is my only second time, yes, exactly. And so the, 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 the woman is like, exit. And mm-hmm. so the guy is then like, you know, man, I'm, the, I'm just what I thought. I'm not good with girls. And, um, and so that only sends him back to the video porn mm-hmm. that increases the addic- addiction because basically the mechanism of addiction is that it's constantly increasing your, your dopamine, which is your feel-good drug. You only feel good when you take more and more risks and get more and more. So you just keep on. pushing it. It worked You're for the pizza guy, it. right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not working for me. <laughs> I, you know, I made this speculation a while ago. We, we've talked about in, on our show early on, in fact, uh, uh, how frustrating and annoying it is to see I have two kids and, and they'll play sports and it's I think it's silly that they'll play and the the, the they won't keep any score and I, I'm not talking about when they play on their own because they always keep score when they play on their own uh-huh. I'm talking about organized leagues who will say oh yeah the yeah, kids yeah. are gonna play there's no score and so we always talk about how that's silly because nobody learn you learn more from losing many times than you do from winning and it's silly that they don't do that but I speculated that that was probably the result of a lot of fatherless, uh, you know, homes, and you have a lot of moms who now are organizing these leagues, and you know, and they they don't want anybody to lose, and yes. it's usually the dads that are ones pushing for the winners and losers. Do you think that's an accurate speculation? That is, again, right on. Perfect uh, speculation. Okay. And the um, and and it's it's Sal just, just wants uh, all these bonus points. Yeah. No, <laughs> yes, no yeah. I'm glad. Was that I, right? Because yeah. I've said yeah. that several times. Anybody? I want to make sure I'm not wrong. No, you know? yeah, no, no, I'm just messing. No, this is absolutely uh, the case. The 
and, and what moms, so what dads need to communicate to moms is that your training, chil- training children to win comes with training children to lose. Uh, you, when, when you train someone to lose gracefully and lose, um, you train them to focus, you train them to be a good sport, um, you, you, train, you train them to know, uh, to, to take risks and to know what does and doesn't work and have it be measurable. You, um, you, you, you do have a greater likelihood of increasing the adrenaline um, to, to, to experiment, to do with what, what works and what doesn't work. You're, you're training children for um, being able to be successful in business, being able to be successful in being rejected by the, somebody else that you want. Yeah, real that, life. That, that, for real life. All of, <laughs> all of you lose life. a lot in real life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and to protect children until they're in college and then continue protecting them in college like we're doing now and then to send them out to real life is cruel. Do you think that what we're seeing right. now with the like the cry closets and the victimization, everybody's a victim, by the yes. way. Um, and uh, it, it, you Except know, white males. Right, right. That's the one <laughs> right. that is it. Do you think that that is the result of all, like now maybe two generations growing up, you know, half of them without fathers? Do you think maybe a- that? Absolutely. Bo- uh, f- f- you know, part of what dads need to communicate, and as I said before, don't let's blame the moms here. We dads have to take responsibility for reading about what our unique contributions to parenting is. And then we have to explain that to moms, and then we have to be strong enough to be okay with moms being sexually withdrawing from us or emotionally withdrawing us for, from us while they and we talk through intention mode um, what is best for the children. Now, why did you say that? Is, mm. you, is that because uh, when when a wife or a mom sexually withdraws from a man, we give in? That's right. Okay. Because you're saying we need to be okay with that. Like, we, in other words, yes. like, you know, she might not want to sleep with you for a couple of weeks while you argue over this, but right. be okay with that. That's right. Okay. We have to have the strength to be okay with not being manipulated by sexual withdrawal. Mm, mm. And the strength to be it's okay. It's a powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool. And it's not just sexual withdrawal, it's also emotional withdrawal. Sure. Mm-hmm. And very few women have any idea of how much we want to be loved by women. Uh, because we can't communicate with each other in very loving and caring ways, uh, we have more dependency, we have more of our emotional eggs are in the basket of women. And so very few women know that, and yet at the same time they know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they do withdraw, and, um, and then we eventually give in. And so then we, fi- we ask ourselves the question, okay, you know, the one thing we are valued for is bringing home a good paycheck. So I'll go back to, uh, so I'll withdraw mm-hmm. from being an and equally just work more. Involved, uh, What's that? And then just work more. Just work more. And so then we experience what I call the father's catch-22, which is we learn to love the family by being away from the love of the family. Mm. But when we ask men a different question, by the way, you just explained my, why my whole divorce right there. Wow. That's a hundred percent what happened between the two of us. Tell, me, mm. tell, tell us more. Oh, it's a hundred percent what happened. There was withdrawal from you know, you know, connection, you know, sex connection. My mm-hmm. withdrawal to work, mm-hmm. and that just for fifteen years, and it just turned yes. into a, a divorce. Hundred yes. percent what you just explained. So, yes. yeah, and it's, it's deeply sad because. There's um, a, a liberal think tank called and research center called the Pew P E W Research Center. Sure. And they, for the first time, they asked dads who were working full time, what would you rather do, work full time or be with involved with your children full time? Mm. That is completely give up work and be involved with your children full time. And forty. It work. 49% of children, of, of sorry, of fathers said they'd prefer to be with their children full time, mm. but they couldn't be because they had to earn the money. Sure. Oh. And that is what feminists are completely missing. Mm. And that is what is, and so, so, so the, almost every problem of the boy crisis goes back to that fatherlessness because it is fathers who, who, who are more comfortable requiring children to go out of their comfort zone. So for example, a kid comes home from um, school and let's say he's seven or eight years of age and he says, Mrs. Moyers, she hates me. I wanna get out of Mrs. Moyers class and it's the first week or two of school. And so mom is far more likely to say something like, 
oh, sweetie, I don't want you to have a bad experience in school right when you're so young in formative years. So, or she's thinking that to herself if she doesn't say it in those words to her seven-year-old son. Yeah. And she's saying, I'll tell you what, sweetie, I'll, go, I'll meet with the teacher, or the principal, and we'll get you the, the other teacher who would probably be better for you. And so, um, and dad is more likely to say, you know, sweetie, uh, you, you know, in life, you're not going to get along with everybody. And you have to learn how to get along with somebody. So maybe you should move out. But before you move out, let's find out from Mrs. Moyers why she's you know, do, behaving the way she is. You share with Mrs. Moyers what your upset is and listen to Mrs. Moyers what, what, what her upset is. By the way, sweetie, what do you think if, you, if I talk to Mrs. Moyers, what do you think she would say? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, de- and then, the, and then, and then the mom will be looking on and saying, "Well, what do you mean? Th- my, our son is suffering here, and you're asking him what you know what what's wrong with him." And so um, the, the the dad then gets from the son, "Well, Mrs. Moyers thinks that I you know um, that I don't pay attention in class." Well, why does she think that? Well, I do p- pass off notes to Jimmy, uh, but it wasn't me passing off notes. It was Jimmy passing off notes, to, uh, and I gave a note back to him. And I got blamed for it, and so Mrs. Moyers is blaming me. Uh huh. And so when is, uh, so when did Jimmy pass off the note to you? The moment Mrs. Moyers turns her back on us, uh, he passes off the note to me. Then I pass the note back to him, and she catches me. Um, so aside from not being a great manipulator, he's uh, <laughs> he's um, he's you know he's beginning to already see what. What maybe is creating the problem, and then and then Dad finally persuades Mom to set up a meeting with Mrs. Moyers and him, and and Mrs. Moyers and the teacher and, and this and their son have a chance to talk with each other about what is bothering them and reach um, you know reach some type of understanding, mm. and maybe that won't work and maybe that does, but Dads are far more likely to sort of push outside of the comfort zone of kids and ask them to do, require them to do what needs to be done uh, to communicate about something rather than just play victim. Mm-hmm. Now, talking about the sc- schools right now, and when you first came in we, we, and we started this conversation around the teasing of each other, mm-hmm. right? So how do you feel about this anti-bullying movement that we've been going through in the last decade or so? Yes, the best way to minimize bullying um, and we you know um, I grew up in the um, 50s and, and 1950s, uh, not 1850s. That's when bullying was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, pretty Greasers much, versus every, jocks. Yeah, everybody yeah. built everybody. But you know, some of the bullying was so bad that you know you were left with scars for a lifetime on the mm-hmm. bullying, or you were left with trying to prove yourself, mm-hmm. you know, um, to the bully. Um, and so bullying, uh, taking to a, a certain uh, past a certain point, bull, um, is really bad. But on the other hand, what we find is that bu- bu- bullying, the bullies and the bully bullied have very similar personalities. They both have low self-esteem. Mm. They both don't do that well in school. They both are, um, are filled with different types of fears. They just have different ways of manifesting it. Mm. And so the bullies are likely to be physically stronger and bigger. Um, but they are also coming from a very uh, fragile place themselves. Mm. And so the solution to bullying, in my opinion, is is probably best done in Denmark. Uh, In Denmark, in the ages of first and second grade, they they have classes um, in uh, in which they talk about, everybody talks about the feelings that they have and what they're experiencing and what they experience everybody else uh, to be like and what their own set of problems are. And so kids get to see each other as full human beings and not as objects. Uh, when, you know, when you can reduce somebody to a simple name and, uh, and get some pleasure out of bullying them and make yourself feel better, um, that comes from a personality that has only that way of feeling better about themselves. And so the solution to bullying is to work on the self-esteem of the bully as well as the bullied and to also work on the communication process so everybody in that classroom sees each other as a full person and sees the amount of pain that that occurs mm. and feels the pain that occurs from somebody that is mm. bullied or pushing around. I, I also you think with yeah. these, with, with, oh, go, you want to go? Ahead yeah. Um, do you see any value too with some schools I know that have structured it where they have different age groups all learning in the same facility, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that way, like you, you're able to 
inevitably you're going to see the older kids kind of sheltering the younger kids mm-hmm. or the younger kids looking up to the older kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they've shown a little bit less on the bullying because mm-hmm. of that as a result. But have you looked into that at all? Yes. And there's, there's two important dimensions to that. One is when, when you have that, it's often coupled with a mentoring process. Mm-hmm. And so where the older boy or, or girl has a, somebody that they're mentoring and where the uh, younger boy or girl is being mentored by somebody. And so being mentored by somebody is very helpful. But more helpful than being mentored by somebody is being a mentor. Mm-hmm. So when you have that type of integrated class age-wise, the and let's say I'm a uh, 14-year-old boy, and I'm, I have a pro, uh, I have a tendency toward bullying, but bullying is not approved of in the school. And so when I start to bully, I worry about how the nine-year-old boy is going to think of me if I'm seen as somebody that's negative in the school and not a really mm-hmm. good role model. So the power of being a mentor is like being the power of being a dad. You start you start becoming more responsible. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's really and, and, yeah, more, that's and more balanced. Interesting. I do think that the you know, I think we tend to do like what Adam said, where we take the pendulum and we swing it so far. Obviously, if kids are being physically bullied or emotionally bullied um, and tormented, that's terrible, and you want to put a stop to it. But I also think there's some value in sometimes letting kids figure them th- things out for themselves. Like if I, if my kid comes to me and says so-and-so pushes me around, bullies me, before I go and, and interject, I may say to my kid, okay, I want you to stand up for yourself and try and solve it yourself. Because we jump in too quickly, too often, because we're so afraid of uh, everything. And, th- and we end up losing the lessons that can be lo- learned. That is exactly right. And, th- and that is why things like teasing and uh, the, you know, which, which now are called bullying, um, right. is, you know, we protect the kids against that. And, and there's a tendency of, you know, moms are very wonderful at nurturing and protecting. And they often take that much too far, mm. much too quickly. And you know, so it is when uh, all females get together and, f- and form teams that they want everybody to be nurtured and no one to learn the risks of, you know, what you were teased, you were, you were bullied. So what do you do about it? Where do you go with that? Why do you think that happened? What could you do differently? Um, you know, uh, what, what's the best, what are some options for best responses? Um, you know, if you, were, if you were a dad, how would you tell your son to do that? Mm. You know, those are all the, the discussions that come from situations that are inconvenient, uh, uncomfortable, and even hurtful. And if we protect our kids from all those things, we are not educating them and preparing them for life. Cause, yeah, we're not making mm-hmm. them strong. We're yes. just protecting them. I mean, look at you know, look at where wh- what you have to do if you're anyone who is successful. If you're a Kavanaugh um, and you you know you're you're wanting to become a Supreme Court justice, are you going to be able to do that without criticism? Every part of your past is mm. going to be ripped apart. Now, mm-hmm. if you're somebody that ca- that could only take praise and you can't take criticism you're going to be you're going to fall apart is uh, in the process of becoming successful let's talk about that for a Absolutely. second that, that that situation with Kavanaugh he's the he's the the gentleman that's going to be potentially appointed as a supreme court justice and a young lady comes out and says that he sexually assaulted her 30 something years ago so she was 15 he was 17 years old and you know i'm not on either side maybe he did maybe he didn't but here's the part that i find extremely frightening and this may be a consequence of this, you know, uh, males are the oppressor, women are the oppressed, you know, victimhood type of mentality in the Me Too movement. And that's that we have to listen to her because she's the one, she's the girl, she's the female, she makes the claim. We have to listen to her. We have to take what she's saying as truth. And a lot of people are doing that. They're saying, listen, listen to the, listen to the victim 100% of the time, all the time. Now, I understand where that sentiment comes from. If you are somebody who's abused, uh, you know, sexually or, you know, h- however else, it can be very scary to come forward and you don't want to feel ridiculed or criticized because that may prevent people from stepping forward. But at the same time, uh, you you know, you can't you can't presume guilty and then proven innocent. It's the other way around. Is Do you think this is the result of kind of like, a, like a, a little bit of a consequence of this whole, you know, mentality that men are the oppressor? So if a woman says something, Hundred percent of the time, it's true. Listen to them every single time. Yes, and it's it, it is really, and first of all, I very much agree with you that you know when, and I love the part of the hashtag Me Too movement that I love, is that women are speaking up and letting our and letting the world know 
what is bothering them. Mm -hmm. So it, Now, it does create a bit of a, a challenge because on the one hand, for the past 50 years, we've learned, I am woman, I am strong. And now we've learned, I've been, I am woman, I've been wronged. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of a, let's see, is, are women strong and they can speak up and say what they want and they need? Or are they fragile and are they repressing the things that are happening and it's only going to come up 20, 30 years later that mm. they've been angry? Um, and so we're going to have to sort of work out that disconnect. Uh, but then secondly, the, um, the Office of Civil Rights literally prevented their investigators from um, writing into a report anything that um, any time a woman said that the sex, sex that she once said was harassment or a date rape, was in fact she that she lied or didn't tell the truth um, because for whatever reason. So, for example, uh, two women, a woman and a man get get drunk together and they have consensual sex, um, but the uh, woman gets um, realizes she didn't call her boyfriend. Um, that was in a different area, like she usually does, and so she says, "Well, you know, I, I was I was in a terrible situation last night. I was raped, and so because she made a bad decision, and so if she does." Does that and the and the boyfriend says, well, you should, you know, you should call the police about that or you should report that, and so then she reports it to prove that she, in fact, you know, was telling the truth, um, and then it's investigated and um, she begins to feel badly that she's ruining that boy's life. Um, she then says to the investigator, um, actually, it was consensual sex at the time, but I was afraid to say so. The Office of Civil Rights required the investigator not to put that second level of comment that, in fact, it was consensual, they could not write that in the report. Why? Wow. Because of exactly what you said before, a woman who comes forward has to be believed. And that's just to encourage... Uh, I can see where that comes from. I mean, yes. we have a lot of laws that are like that where they're based off of feeling good, but nobody really exempl looks at the, the, the potential consequences. Because I, I can understand... Why they might want to put that law forward and say, okay, we want we don't want women to be afraid. We want women, you know, people who are uh, you know assaulted to come forward because it takes a lot of courage many times. So I can see the sentiment behind why, but that what a terrible consequence. Yes, it's a good case in, in in the legal field. They have a expression called "good cases make bad laws," and so we, we, when we're so desirous of protecting the female, we are willing to give away due process. And we've grown up, you know, the very core of uh, America, which makes it a special country in many ways, but other countries have this too, is you're, not, you're, you're considered innocent until proven guilty. And so the person who makes the accusation has to prove that accusation. Mm -hmm. And we've suddenly said, oh, but ex with the exception of women who feel that they were sexually abused or sexually assaulted or, um, you know, and, you know, or date, had a date rape experience, you are not only to be believed but even if you acknowledge that you did lie then we won't believe you because we know we're going to pay attention to any expression of upset that you had more than an expression of um, well actually I lied for this reason or that reason and we know we have very few good studies of the percentage of time that women lie in these situations but um, in the myth of male power, I, I did uncover four or five very good studies to uh, this effect, and the and the range was between forty percent and sixty percent that uh, women did um, not tell the truth. Wow, I would never have guessed that. that. I would have thought it, it was an extremely you know small percentage. Yes, and that's what we're left with from the feminist um, not st mm. statements. But they are you know if, if you. You know, if you wish to see the, the hard data behind that in the myth of male power in the chapter on the politics of sex and the politics of rape, I sort of discuss all the, you know, the studies. That how how long from. were you um, part of the feminist movement? How long were you part of the NOW organization? I was elected three times to the board of NOW in New York City, and then I'd say that was um, like 1970 to 1973, 74. Okay. And then um, I was, um, my, my former wife, um, became a White House fellow, so we moved from New York City to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, I, I became the wife of a fellow, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so are you now advocating for boys and men 
because because I know what, there's going to be some people listening right now who are thinking, oh gosh, you know, we don't man men don't need an advocate, men don't need somebody speaking out for them. Women are the ones that need. But in in some cases, I agree. But also, women do have a lot of advocates, a lot of people speaking out on their behalf, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, did you are you doing this for men because you just see nobody's doing it? That's basically correct. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen. And as and as you you were saying, the, the, we have a tendency for the pendulum to swing from one this one extreme to the other. And uh, when I started to speak out and, and say some things like, you know, well, wait a minute, we have to be fair to both boys and girls. So my, my basic attitude is that we don't have a system of oppressors and oppressed. We have a that when it comes to male female issues, we're all in the same family boat. <clears throat> Whenever either, whenever only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Because you know, my wife and I were in this together, and if she's hurt, I'm hurt. Um, and if um, and if we get a divorce, our children suffer. And so I was beginning to see the balance, the pendulum swing to the other side. And so I started to say, well, wait a minute. To be fair here, I there there has to be. Um, an understanding of what boys are going through as well as girls, and which is why I did the role reversal date and the men's beauty contest mm-hmm. both, because I was getting both sexes to walk a mile in each other's moccasins. Now, now, oh, sorry, go ahead. Was there was there a a pivotal moment that m- switched you doing that? Like, did something happen? You're like, whoa, that's not fair, and then you began speaking out on the other side. When for the most part, it was very evolutionary, but okay. I'd say if there was one moment that was more pivotal than the other. It was I was on at a board meeting with now the National Organization for Women, and um, one of the women um, on the board of now said we're having a problem that a lot of uh, we're getting a number of letters from some of our now members uh, saying that um, they don't like it that when our position on equality seems to be being interpreted that when there's a divorce that the father has as much right to the children as the mother. They didn't uh, like that. They, they didn't. Well, the, 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 the women writing in were saying they didn't like that oh. and they were going to withdraw their now memberships if they felt that now was not supporting them, no, them the mother, knowing what was best for the child. And so um, I listened to that and uh, their reasoning was they were worried about losing their they're uh, dividing and losing now members and therefore being a less potent group and they felt they had a lot more to to to, to work with for than just custody issues and so while they understood that equality should be applied to both sexes they at the same time were cared about their political power uh, as well allowed them to persuade their decision and, exactly and so i said wait a minute the issue here should not be where our political power rests <clears throat> but rather it should be, you know, position by position, we should be asking the question, not as be- not what's best for women, but what's best for the children. And so they said, well, women should have the freedom to, to raise the children the way they want. And I said, well, you should have freedom to have children. But once you have children, that's a free choice to forfeit your freedom in, and exchange it for what's ever best for the children. Your personal freedom does not trump your children's best outcome. And so so they said, well, you know, so what do you think we should do? And I said, well, I think if you want to work from an equal p- perspective, children should have both mother and father. And uh, well, then what about a woman who meets a new man and wants to get rid of an oppressive um, husband and wants to move to a new area, which is the new man is a better, and, and an out of state, and they should have the right to do that. And I said, well... We have to do research and find out how children turn out mm. when they have this out- outcome. So then I began my research that led to a, a book called Father and Child Reunion, and the um, and I started to see that my instinct on that that children do best when they have both parents was way um, it was it was ac- much more accurate than I expected. But then this was. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, when I started doing, when I had this dispute with NOW, um, and that, um, but that led people at NOW to be suspicious that I wasn't just supporting women, Mm. uh, that I was also taking fathers into consideration and children into consideration. And so I began to lose some of my speaking engagements, and then I had to ask myself, do I want to, you know, I was doing extremely well financially, 
um, speaking all around the world on women's issues. And it was really clear to me that if I started to do this type of thing, that I was going to lose that type of you know career support. And I was able to get on, you know, I was on every major TV show, the Today Show, the Tomorrow Show, and People Magazine, Parade Magazine. I was center, you know, centerfold features and stuff like that. And I had a huge, and people were coming to my um, performances at, you know, in, in numbers over a thousand. And so it was, you know, it was seductive in a lot of ways and very financially helpful. And so I really had to confront myself and say, you know, am I, am I in this for the money and the fame or am I in this to really help men and women understand each other? God, how many people and, struggle with that decision right there? Yes, yes, exactly. And what happened when you when you made that switch? Did you just lose gigs and Oh, yeah. I went, I went from maybe 50 to 60 um, highly paid speaking engagements at universities per year to zero to one. Oh, um, shit. At, wow, at, just like that. At, at, at universities. Um, I do, you know, since the Boy Crisis book has come out, I've been doing them um, speaking engagements at a lot of different types of places. Mm -hmm. But um, but not any and uh, not any at universities sponsored by a university. You know, wow. I've, I've I've watched a lot of your videos and talks, and obviously you now we've talked now for over an hour. And to me, you're advocating for uh, real equality, freedom mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. both genders. You're saying things like, "Look, here's the problems that are that men or boys are encountering." You're advocating for fathers to stay to be fathers uh you know and that you're saying that it's best for a child to have both parents which sounds like common sense to me mm -hmm. why are you getting so much hate why are right. people it doesn't make any sense to me i don't understand it is yeah, it it's well, rational uh, thinking uh, yeah on one level it doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> and and but i do remember you know when i first started coming out with these things you know guys would come up to me the men in my men's group and say Real, warren you realize if you you know if you say this what will the feminists think and it was like you know, Bob, I'm not going to live my life trying to kowtow to somebody's thinking that I don't feel is is good in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to lose all the income you're making in the gigs, and he was 100% right. Um, but I so I said, well, I got a PhD for a reason, and one of the reasons I got the PhD was so I could be economically secure um, if I, you know, if if this if my speaking out in this way does not succeed. And clearly I lost, you know, multiple millions of dollars. And I was up for, apparently, I f only found out later, a MacArthur Genius Award that, you <sighs> know, when, it, when, I found, when they oh, found wow. out that I was, you know, um, taking the positions I was taking, apparently somebody spoke up and volunteered that information and I was dropped from the consideration. And a number of things like this that I don't want to say, elaborate on too much because mm -hmm. I don't want to sort of, you know, be in that position. Sure, sure. But um, there's, um, so I knew I was going to pay a price. Mm -hmm. and But I also knew that I, I had saved up enough, enough income mm -hmm. to feel like if I completely lost my economic security, um, I had a little bit to work on and I could make a transition. Do you That's think the right thing to do. You yeah. were led by that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I do you think right. some of the some of this can be blamed on, because I know when, when uh, especially when there's presidential elections, there's a lot of money being spent on trying to sway voters. And one of the easiest way to manipulate people, and I talk about this all the time on the show, is to make someone feel like they're a victim. If you can make someone feel like a victim and that you have the solution, they're going to they're gonna vote for you. Yes. And so do you think some of the, the blame can be put on politicians? Because I remember recently it became a big deal, the pay gap, the, way, the, the gender pay gap became a big deal. Now, if economists, when they break it down, most economists will break it down and be like, okay, there really is no 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 gender pay gap. That's due to sexism. There is a pay gap, but it's due to differences in, you know, uh, preferences. And and here's the bottom line, by the way, uh, if if a company can order can can hire an employee that does the same work for less money, that's all they'll do. So in other words, if it were true that women got paid less purely because they were women. You know, women um, fill the companies. <laughs> companies would hire all women. They, they outsource to other countries for this exact reason. They would do the same thing here. So it's, we know it's false, but politicians push it because, hey, you know, we're going to have the solution. If you vote for us, we're going to make legislation that will actually probably be, be damaging. Do you think some of the blame can be placed on, on, on politicians trying to make you know, people feel like victims, especially women? Because I feel like they're getting, they've been manipulated quite a bit by political parties. Yes. Uh, a politician can only be a step ahead um, of the people. 
And so if people, if, if and so when, when we approach politicians, as I chair a commission to create a White House Council on Boys and Men, and we we went out to the um, Republican candidates for uh, for president um, uh, when, when they were running in the primaries, mm-hmm. and we talked to them about this issue. But I could just feel and see that you know no politician was going to say um, that. The pay gap is not about sexism because wow. he he was going to make, make she or he was going to make uh, their constituency furious at them, mm-hmm. and they were going to lose a huge amount of votes. Who cares? Who cares that 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 is true? That women are the victims of discrimination, uh, mostly women, and what and where where are the majority of his votes mostly women, mm-hmm. and so they were going to. It was just a, a lose situation. Now to be clear, men get po- men get manipulated uh, by politics. Politicians too, just differently. Right. We, we t- they tend to appeal to our nationalism and strength and all that other stuff. So we all tend to get manipulated. It seems as if uh, you know humans evolved with this balance of things that you know women tend to bring to society and what men tend to bring to the society. I know Jordan Peterson calls it order and chaos. And if you go too extreme in one direction, you know if you go too extreme in the male direction, you end up with you know fascism and. Uh, you know, and, and these nationalistic type of, you know, very violent, you know, mm-hmm. too much order, too much law. Mm-hmm. And if you go in the other direction, then it's then it's the opposite. Um, and so the pendulum is just doing this thing back and forth. What do we see? What are we looking forward in the future then? What, is, what are some of the issues? I know there's some statistics like for the first time ever, boys are going to be less educated than their fathers and boys are doing worse in college than than girls are for the for the most part this is like the first time ever is that the result of this pendulum being being swung over uh yes um, well in a lot of different ways the boys have been doing uh, there's been a smaller percentage of male college graduates for quite a long time now um and since the i think it's the late 70s oh wow that long um, okay. so, so um and so the so boys have been We've we've been giving scholarships to girls um, in schools in many different areas, and pretty much the only scholarships to boys are in sports areas, which are not for academics, but obviously for sports. Mm -hmm. And so we have really... um, and and I saw this. I was you know in touch with the data on this for for many years, and so I saw the swing happening. But I saw it happening more and more. And then instead of encouraging boys to get involved in areas where they weren't involved with because of their gender, things like social sciences and psychology and and the health professions, which are the which are the growth oriented professions mm-hmm. of the future, uh, we were just focusing on getting girls involved in the STEM professions: the science, technology, engineering, and math. And so um, this was, um, and I was very pleased with the encouragement of uh, girls and women to be involved, involved with science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but it's, um, but I, I was very displeased with the fact that we weren't helping our sons um, be trained for emotional intelligence and and um, getting involved in the caring professions and and becoming father, what I call father warriors. You know, I think if we really want to help the future. More than any other single thing, we need to develop and nurture the concept of father warriors. Mm. And by, by, by that I mean from the first, second grade on, our children need to be involved in communication classes, what we were talking about in relation to um, minimizing the bullying, mm-hmm. so that boys in the future who are not expected to earn all the money as a sole breadwinner the degree to which men do not earn money as sole breadwinners is the degree to which women will want something from us other than money, mm. and the, and we and we're not going to be of value to women unless we have the listening skills, the facilitation skills. I spend almost an, an hour a night listening to my wife who owns her company, um, you know, dealing with the frustrations and problem solving with her. But usually, ninety percent of what I do is just plain listen. And don't solve problems. I ask. Just, I do what you were talking about before. I ask mostly questions like, "Well, what do you think we sh- you should do about that?" And and uh, facilitative questions that help her solve her problems rather than me solve the problem for her, uh, or say to her something like, um, "You know, you should really don't worry about working. I'll mm-hmm. take care of that." Mm-hmm. You know, and try to protect her from something she gets a great deal of purpose out of. Yeah, I think that's important. I think it's important that we we create a culture where boys and girls feel that they can be whatever they want. Yes. But I also think it's equally important that we don't go so far as to create laws that force 
uh, you know, situations to happen because there's a lot of unintended consequences of doing that. You know, if you if you think that the gender pay gap, for example, is due to sexism, which it's not, but let's say you you pass law, you're like it is. It's due to sexism, so you mm-hmm. pass all these laws. All you're doing is you're increasing the liability of potentially hiring a woman now because a company's like, well, we got to be careful if we hire this woman. We got to get all these different laws. And even if she chooses not to make as much, we got to be very careful. And so in the reality, you actually end up hurting the very people that you're trying to help. This is, you have, again, um, put your finger on exactly why I am so motivated because what we're doing now is not what feminism should be. We are making women weaker. We are, uh, you know, we're we're making an employer who might have been afraid of hiring a woman for one set of stereotypical reasons 50 years ago, afraid of hiring a woman because um, if somebody touches her the wrong way, she can sure have say it's a problem. If somebody decides to mentor her, many many men that I speak to in companies say. If I have a family, I'm not going to mentor. Uh, I have a family. If I mentor a woman and she doesn't go as far, as fast as she thinks she should go, mm-hmm. then I'm likely to be accused of being a bad mentor. Mm-hmm. Or I'm, if I close the do- if I if I want to give her privacy, so I close the door to my office. Um, if there's no window in that door, uh, that door, I got nailed I, for that one. I, I could be. Oh, did you? Really? Oh, yeah. Yes. No, I had a, I had an employee one time that uh, I was, you know, she did something wrong, and I pulled her in the office to to speak to her and and talk about it, and she flipped it around on me and called HR for you know cornering her and locking her into an office, and wow. because she's a female and it was just me and her, I almost lost my job over it. Yes. Well, subconsciously, yeah. even if you're the most self aware, evolved individual, subconsciously you may have these fears from hiring women or whatever because of you know some of these some of these laws that get passed because they feel good mm-hmm. and they end up hurting people it's funny you know economists talk about this all the time thomas sowell is an economist that i i, I love reading and he talks about how you know if if pay differences were the result of discrimination if they were the result of sexism which they're not but let's say they were what you're doing by passing laws, forcing employers to pay them the same amount for the equal work is you are actually taking away their bargaining chip. So let's just say you are a woman and you do live in a society that's extremely sexist to the point where an employer will pay you 75 cents on the dollar for doing exactly the same stuff. And now there's a law saying you can't do that. Well, if they're sexist, uh, well, then I'm gonna, since I'm paying you the same amount as a man, then I'm just going to hire men. Mm-hmm. And so there's all kinds of unintended consequences that follow from these policies that are passed because they feel good rather than you know being based on actual reality, truth, and even just consequences. Yes, and and as you said before, and when I did the research for why men earn more and what women can do about it, the you know the co- the first thing that got me doing the research, I was, I was, I started the thinking on this process when I was um, with Now, and I was leading the um, the Women's Strike for Equality's Man's Section. And I was thinking, and, w- and these were the days when women were be- supposedly being paid fifty-nine cents to the dollar for the mm-hmm. same work as men. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm, I could start a whole bunch of companies, hire only women, and I'll compete, and, with and I could produce the same product for fifty-nine cents that other people were producing for a dollar. I'd wipe everybody out. And then I started asking myself, well, if I Really, if that I wonder if that's true or whether it's more complex than that, and that got me going mm-hmm. on wondering whether it was true mm-hmm. or more complex mm-hmm. with that because obviously, if you know, and the thing is that somebody may not be wise enough to do that, but the person that was wise enough to do, to do with that would um, would finally they would you know, dominate. They would dominate. Exactly. They would dominate. Do you also think that maybe it's also that there's there societally speaking that the entrepreneur, the risk taker. The money maker gets all a lot of the accolades, and so and the, but the 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 person who takes care of the kids, who connects with the other parents, who you know who is in the community, which is by the way, not equally as important in my opinion, probably more important. Okay, in my opinion, probably more important. But let's let's just say it's equally important. Do you think that maybe you know uh, they think of men as the oppressors because? those risky things get all the accolades accolades, and what they're doing, maybe nobody's really giving them credit or they're not hearing a lot about it and society doesn't seem to value it as much. Therefore, 
hey, it's not fair. You know, I have to stay home and do this thing over here. And, and they get all this attention because they're running this multi-million dollar company. So this isn't fair. Do you think that may be part of it? Yes, and it's it's part of what it's part of what contributes to to the deception. Uh, what we do, and the reason I talk in the Boy Crisis book so much about social bribes is that one of the ways we got men to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week to give up family um, to do things that they had to do, like be the principal of the school or the mm. superintendent of schools, rather than do what their passion was. Uh, we got them to do that, uh, to be to join the military and um, and be willing to die. Uh, was we we bribed them with names and titles and accolades and glory and, and glory and, yeah. exactly. And so th- what we guys have to get is that it's a, not a good definition of power to feel obligated to earn money that someone else spends while we die early. Mm. If I were to say, I'm going to do an empowerment seminar for women, I'm going to teach you how to earn money, feel obligated to earn money that somebody else will spend while you die early. (laughs) I'd be like, like, you must be crazy. Right. But we have been ignorant, naive, stupid enough to accept that definition of power Mm. and to to, to be a, a victim of the need to be feel that we have self esteem by being praised and getting those accolades, rather than ask. But when the Pew Research Center says to men, "What would you really love to do?" Still, even in this framework of these accolades, forty nine percent of fathers said prefer to be with my children because once you've had a taste of love, you realize that working away from the home. It's not nearly as fulfilling. Is, uh, to, to get love is not nearly as fulfilling to most people. Now, for some men, it may be more fulfilling. And for some women, it's more fulfilling, obviously. Uh, but women have these three options, work full-time, children full-time, or some combination of both. And our three options are still work full-time, work full-time, work full-time. And then we're told we have the power. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think there's a lot of people because, you know, maybe uh, let's say a lot of girls who grow up and hear this, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, I'm oppressed, that rather than doing what maybe they really want to do, uh, which is you know uh, maybe work part time or not work and, and have children, that they or be a mother. They push themselves right. to do to to work, 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 go to school, get a PhD. You know, thirty seven years old, working, I make a lot of money. Thirty eight years old, whatever. And then you know, do you think there's a lot of these people who are like not finding fulfillment and, and not being happy because they did the opposite? because of the thought that they were being oppressed? Yes, I think there is a certain percentage that way. The good news is we, for women, we do have a society where if the woman becomes like my, our daughter is um, home taking care of um, our grandson and she's full-time home, she's working from home with Etsy, um, but she works as, in a flexible type of way from home. And so she feels perfectly acknowledged by us and most people for doing that. If my son-in-law were to be the one doing that, there'd be much more of a mixed message. Mm. On the other hand, if our daughter was more oriented toward um, earning a lot of money and was the primary breadwinner, she'd be she'd get mostly accolades for doing that. Sure. And if she did some combination of both, we'd be okay with that. And so we're giving women much more permission to go the direction that their personality dictates. And that's what we as parents need to do. The first, you know, f- for the first time in history, we have the potential for boys actually becoming human beings rather than human doings. Mm-hmm. For our for our for father and so we we have we have to be encouraging our sons as well as our daughters to get in touch with um, who they are and not um, what other people will praise them for. Mm. Praise is a social bribe that can be a prison um, for, for doing what you want to do. And the degree to which a certain percentage of women have gone that way and just worked and then they get to be 35 and they realize, my God, I've been so attached to my work, I maybe can't have a child now. Um, and so that is that is a problem that a number of women are you, experiencing. You said something uh, earlier that I thought was really fascinating about the, the cheerleader analogy with the football player. Do we see this also in other examples in life? I'm just curious if you've wrote, written about this, 
uh, in like adulthood. Is there more examples that are similar to that where the, where the cheerleader is cheering us on to go take risks like that and so we feel compelled to do that? Is there, is, is there examples of that in, in well, adulthood? Uh, ba- basically, boys become men who are doing that type of thing all the time. So when, when a man um, and a woman begin to th- think about having a child, and the woman makes, you know, is the the, the family discussions are often, um, you know, what will the woman um, do? Will she do this full time work, full time children, some combination of both? And the man sits around, sort of waiting for, okay, after she makes her decision, I have to figure out how much money I need to make to make it, you know, to be able to move into a good neighborhood with good schools and so on. And so um, he is for the rest of his life being praised, or at least minimally acknowledged for doing the earning of the money without ever asking himself the question, do I, did I really want to become, remain a teacher or do, be an artist or an actor that doesn't make a great deal of money um, and, but, uh, and bring our children up at the $50,000 a year level uh, rather than the $250,000 a year level? And um, that, that's... The, so I think men do this till the day they die. Mm. And oftentimes, <clears throat> when a man's reputation is for, you know, he, he got to a certain level in, as, a, as a CEO or as a, um, as a top executive, um, and that's what we admire him for. In fact, he, when you ask him, would, would you have loved to have spent more time at the office or would you have loved to have spent more time at the, with the family? Almost to a man, Men say, "I wish I had spent more time with my family, rather than at work." Mm. Mm-hmm. I think if we if we if we continue if we do what you say and and encourage kids to, or at least create a society where they're free to choose whatever they want, I think we'll still see lots of differences, but we'll be okay with them. Yes, I mm-hmm. think you know if you look at there's a biological uh, difference here. I mean, you know, st- studies will show that, for example, uh, if a man has a scar on his face. Many times women will find him more attractive. Well, you know, anthropologists say, well, that's probably because he demonstrates that he's can really to take risks and, you know, fight for resources and whatever. That's not true or the opposite. If a woman has a scar on her face, she's not typically considered more attractive by a man because we don't necessarily value that in women where we as we may value more things like fertility, empathy, and care. They may value things like risk taking, assertiveness, and confidence and, and those types of things. So I think there's a biological driver and I think it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand the push that's so hard. I do understand early on, there definitely were some uh, oppressive situations. Women weren't given the same rights. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to, to do certain things. But today we all are. And I think it's okay if we choose to do whatever the heck we want. Absolutely. The whole, the whole purpose of gender liberation is to create choice for both sexes. And you're absolutely right that if we do that, there still will be a significant male-female gap in choices. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, what, we, what we do want to do, though, is see areas where there is um, a lack of encouragement and mm. discouragement. Uh, so, and that's particularly true with valuing men as potential fathers. Mm-hmm. And I was saying before about co- creating the concept of a father warrior, and the first step is to train boys to be able to communicate in school. A second step is to train parents to be able to, you know, when asked, uh, to, you know, if you have a younger sister or younger brother, to change their diapers with them, you know, and, and to feed them together and to, to be considerate of them, but also be challenging of them, to, you know, to, to learn from an early age that you will eventually be a dad and here are the skills that it takes mm. to be a dad and to value those and that is that to be a dad full time it's going to take overcoming a lot of barriers that's why you're called a warrior mm. um, to, because warriors overcome barriers and so if you um, and, and then um, so there's hundreds of things we can do in the school system and at at, our, at home to train boys to be good future fathers, including mentoring, including Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, and, and, and learning how to talk about their emotions and feelings rather than repress their emotions and feelings. Excellent, excellent. Mm. Great mm. conversation. Yeah. 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 Great conversation. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Thank you, me too. Yeah, thank you for coming on the show. It's been really a pleasure. The, You're always welcome down here. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. That's really nice. All right, thank you.